Afghanistan, fortress of Mazar Sharif. These images were shot a year ago by the special forces of the Northern Alliance. This footage you are watching is exceptional. These prisoners that are being led one by one are dangerous, very dangerous. They belong to Al-Qaeda, bin Laden's organization. They surrendered the day before in Kunduz to the soldiers of the Northern Alliance. They came from all around the world to lead the holy war from Afghanistan. What matters above all at this moment is to make these men talk. Whatever the cost, the key is to get information on the hiding places of bin Laden and Mullah Omar. <laughs> Blended in with the soldiers from the Alliance, two CIA agents are here with that one goal in mind, Dave and Mike. But the two Americans do not realize that their presence ignites deep hatred. The Taliban's are exasperated by two months of intensive bombardment from the U.S. Air Force. These men, kneeling in front of them, were trained to hate America. Give us a chance to breathe. We cannot without this. So when Mike and Dave interrogate the Taliban's, voices suddenly break out. What do you lose? What do you lose? Sir, some some bitch over my hand. What do you lose? We lose, we see that bomb, that man blow himself up, kill us. Not from us, no, not, not from, from us, man, try. <laughs> then you're afraid, huh? Eh? Yes, of course. Not we from me, from them. All, all the whole body have checked already, sir. sir check please. me, check me, hey, hello. Check me first. He's terrorist. Yes, he's yes. terrorist. These men are terrorists. Believe. These men are terrorists. All these men are terrorists. I think you terrorists. Right. Yeah. You come here to... Hey, uh, you, right here. Mike notices one man, but he couldn't imagine that this prisoner might be a fellow citizen. You have that, Oscar Miguel. A strange confrontation is engaged between both men. Mike will never know that he was interrogating John Walker Lind, the American Taliban. Irish, English. Where are you from? Where are you from? Are you from England? The problem is he needs to decide if he wants to live or die and die here. I mean, if he don't want to die here, he's going to die here. Because we're just going to leave and they're gonna, he's going to fucking sit in prison the rest of the fucking, you know, short life. It's his decision, man. We can only help those guys who want to talk to us. We can only get the Red Cross to help so many guys. If they don't talk to us, we can't. We do, you can't. Know, do you know the people you're here hey, look at me. Do you know the people that you're here working with are terrorists? They killed other Muslims. There were several hundred Muslims killed in bombing. While the inspection of the prisoners continues, a Taliban is suddenly going to stand up a grenade in his hand. Allah Akbar, God is great. The picture will shake and then disappear. In the following seconds, Mike will die. Just as the fortress fires up, another story begins, my story. After a month of waiting in Uzbekistan, I finally reach Afghanistan. This is it, here we go. I'm 30 years old. I was a marketing manager in a big cosmetics firm. And three months ago, I decided to abandon it all, to follow my childhood dream. Go to Afghanistan, on the footsteps of great travelers. 
I don't know what war is. I barely know how to use a camera. But I'm here, and that's the most important. I have three companions with me on this adventure. Dodge, the American, a playboy who left the Mormons of Salt Lake City to land here. Oleg, the Russian, just as quiet as Dodge is talkative. I was told it's normal for a photographer. And Alex, British, a special envoy for Time magazine. I met him a month earlier in Uzbekistan. The two stories merge when we meet Alex in Mazari Sharif. He told us about the rebellion that was taking place 15 kilometers away. Alex has been following the event since the beginning, in an odd way, in fact. As he was going to Bamiyan, his taxi broke down near the fortress. And then we heard, you know, rat -a -tat echoing across the, the desert around Mazar. It continued. For 10 minutes, we were standing outside the taxi. We managed to repair the taxi and turn around and went back through Mazar to Kalajangi. Um, when we arrived, We parked the taxi down the road, walked up to the fort. We were met by an alliance commander, quite a low-ranking commander, who tried to tell us there was nothing going on. And uh, a rocket grenade sort of passed quite close overhead and exploded in a field, and this guy just started laughing. So we decided <laughs> maybe there was something going on. Two minivans of American Special Forces and two Land Rovers carrying British SAS turned up, ran into the fort, and actually asked us and the ICRC what was going on. Their primary mission was to extract any Americans. Mike was, well, at that stage, MIA. Uh, no one had any idea what had happened to him. According to Alex, there already are many dead. The night falls on Mazar. From my bedroom window, I can hear the sound of fighting far away. I really can't wait for it to begin. Monday, 7 o'clock in the morning. How strange. A taxi drops us off in front of the fortress, where the fighting carried on through the night. Dodge, Oleg and Alex are with me. There is also Najib, our guide. We're looking for a way to get in. An unidentified object flies by us. I turn to Alex. What's that? Alex, a rocket. Me. Oh. As we move forward, we meet a soldier from the Alliance. He warns us. When you reach the first wall, you will run without cover for some 15 meters. Dodge rushes forward, then Alex. I'm then thinking about this story that I heard. When he sees the first runner, the sniper arms his gun. For the second runner, he aims. On the third runner, he fires. I'm the third runner. I run with fear in my belly. And I reached the other side, safe and sound. I see a dead body. It draws me immediately into the wall. It doesn't shock me. I'm a little like the Alliance soldiers, with my back against the wall. But behind them, I feel sheltered. I feel that my camera is protecting me. I'm no longer hearing the sound of bullets except when they whiz above my head. We are here, in the eastern tower held by the Alliance. The Taliban's are gathered in the southern courtyard. It's in this pink house that everything began the day before. 
The Taliban seized the ammunition reserve first. Then they took control of the underground tunnels and transformed them into real trenches. The Alliance soldiers are positioned all around. Between the Taliban and us, there is less than 200 meters. Here's a pickup truck loaded with shells. Where did it come from? Strange. Weird. This man walked through fields to steal shoes from the dead. The pickup is turned into a hearse. It seems that this is what happens during wars. This is center stage. There's action. And the actors are good. All I need is to press the record button and frame on instinct. The film is being directed without me, up to the dialogue that is being said behind my back. The action turns into a photo session. From the beginning, the fighter behind me has been organizing the scene with his eye on my camera screen. And to think that this little game is taking place under Taliban fire. I would never have imagined such lightheartedness in the face of death. Everything seems fine, so to speak. Until everyone starts doing his own little number for my camera. I wonder, back home, would we turn our weapons against each other in a situation like this? Even I didn't move, although the gun was aimed towards me. I've been in Afghanistan for less than a day, and I'm already adjusting to all of this. 10 a.m. We need to leave. Najib said it's an order from the Alliance. We try to find out what they want to hide from us. In fact, it's nothing. Najib just got scared, and he invented this story to get out. Najib looks better once we're on the other side. I'm just behind him, on the left of these images shot by Dodge. Being on the lookout, Najib has just learned that the American task force has arrived. It's the famous 12th Mountain Division. Of course, I want to ask them questions, but I don't want them to prevent me from filming. So, I remain silent. Everyone is looking at each other, without getting in the way. It's also true for the Afghans. They're scanning the fortress, so I do the same. Yet, 
I don't know what to look for. But it's important to follow the action. They seem to be trying to locate their buddies. All right, fellas, what happened is they're inside the front gate and they're trying to move up into their cast position so they can see and it's taking a lot of fire. So. This man is getting the coordinates of the target. No aircraft at this time. No. Then he transmits them to the headquarters of the American forces in Afghanistan, where the hit is being directed from. We get the airplanes on. You could think we're in a movie. Can I take pictures? Some pictures. What's that? Can I take pictures? He's asking if you can take pictures. I would rather you did take take a picture of my face. He would prefer not this face. Hey guys, get out. get out. A warning from the headquarters. The strike is imminent. They're aiming the building where the Taliban's are entrenched. Like everyone else, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear the sound of the aircraft or of the missile arriving, Correction. not knowing that the aircraft flies at 10,000 meters and that the missile goes faster than speed of sound. Then I wait some more, and like Dodge, I turn off the camera. Hey, hey, it's up. There's shrapnel inbound. Shrapnel inbound. The American officer pulls me backwards. Behind me, Najib is screaming. This is wrong. That was absolutely wrong. Please cut it, this one. Please cut it. Are you okay? They shot out. Please cut it. Please cut it. Secure rep over. Cut it, over. Cut it. Cut it, please. This is wrong, very wrong. The Alliance representative is very worried. General Rosie, who was in the fortress, might be hit. The American officer then asks Dodge to check the impact in his viewfinder. Behind us, Alex is worried. Najib starts up again. Hey man, who's your commander? They're inside the fort. The ones that can report this. No, I think, I think they got the right one. The building that the town had. The man in charge, Majid Bozi. He was there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they, they were. I told you before that it was, it, it was going to be wrong. Oh, no, second. Right. It didn't hit. Look it up. They're all It hit the place we were. Najib tries to convince Alex that the missile fell exactly where we were an hour earlier. In short, we made a narrow escape. There's something wrong with this situation. The American officer takes off. What a mess. <laughs> the first survivors from the fort are arriving. Behind me, they're trying to find out what just happened.
It's Dodge who continues to shoot. I turn my camera off, and I'm taking photos, as if to freeze time, because things have been happening way too fast for these last few hours. These men just escaped death. They're not angry. They don't even blame those who nearly got them killed. Why? Out of fear? Belief in fate? And what if it was their natural behavior towards danger? The parade of pickups resumes towards the fortress. The American task force gets ready to rescue their own, as well as the infamous Special Air Service, the British commandos. Slightly isolated from the chaos, there is an imperturbable Afghan, his face covered with dust and with his inevitable walkie-talkie in hand. Information spreads about the first casualties. Off camera, the Alliance representative talks about several dead. I ask him to repeat for the camera, and there everything changes. What, what, hap what happened down there is that lots of people... Only two, three people injured. Only two, three people yes, injured? Yes, injured, yeah. A few wounded in front of the camera. Lots of dead off camera. I was warned beforehand. The Afghans can say anything. The Pentagon did say that five Americans have been injured. The Brits did say four British have been injured. Uh, so that's nine people out of a force of maybe 14, 15. So that's a sizable chunk. I mean, those guys, are, you know, even the ones, and those are the serious injured. You know, everyone else was, was deaf, for starters, for at least a day. Back to Mazar. The task force warned us. Tonight it's forbidden to go inside the fortress. An AC-130 aircraft will strike again. Nevertheless, we try to go back. In vain. No one wants to accompany us. That night, images clash in my mind. Once again, I won't sleep much. Standing on the hotel balcony with this satellite phone, I share with my girlfriend the emotions I felt throughout the day. My first day of war. Tuesday, 6 o'clock in the morning. Here yesterday at the same time, we had to advance with our heads down. Today we can walk normally. The area was cleared. After the bombings throughout the night, we expected to see a mass of ruins. Now that the dust has settled, we can clearly see the impact of the missile on the wall. Like yesterday, we go through the Northeast Tower. When we see this image, we say to ourselves that we had a narrow escape. An Afghan version of breakfast, or hashish, by way of a small black coffee. <coughs> no wonder if war takes strange shapes here. The Taliban's left behind them body shells of charred armor. With less fighters, you get less shots, so we go further into the fortress, which looks monstrous. Far away, we can see spirals of smoke. That's what's left of the ammunition reserve bombarded during the night. The noose is tightening around the Taliban. We decide to venture toward the main entrance. No agitation here, too, but only for the wounded who are being evacuated. An hour later, a Northern Alliance soldier, a.k.a. Mujahideen, plays the sniper. No one ordered him to shoot. Once again, 
I have a hard time understanding this game played with death. How he trained, how, how he learned to use weapons. He's laughing and saying that even a child in Afghanistan knows how to operate a gun. This is General Rosie, still alive. He's in charge of the operation to gain back control over the prisoners. The last night they were all bombed and a lot of uh, storage, ammunition storages were all bombed and they are no more. And uh, they will start their uh, attack simultaneously at 10 o'clock. This morning? This morning. It's odd to yell that the time for battle has come. Maybe they want us to film the event. Big mistake. If you get hit, we will have a diplomatic incident on our hands. I do not guarantee their security. Make sure to tell them I can't guarantee their security. A subtle way of telling us that we're not wanted any longer. But instead of leaving, we stay. And we really start feeling that we're persona non grata. If they're trying to hide something from us, it inevitably means that there's something interesting to see. What could it be? The arrival of the American task force with Dave, the CIA agent who survived Sunday's fighting. These men are here to recover Mike's dead body, the other CIA agent who was killed in the beginning of the rebellion. They don't want us to think that they are here to join the battle and to do the dirty work instead of the alliance. So the less footage, the better. A brief look from Dave in our direction, a little sign with his hand, will suffice to get us out of here. This time we used all our trump cards. A last attempt to get a little more footage. Finally, Dodge and I give up. Oleg and Alex stay, but not for long. Kicked out of the front door, I try to come back in through the window. In this instance, the walls are our windows. The south walls that the Alliance soldiers are trying to retake from the Taliban. <laughs> They took refuge inside the building, and we don't have any grenades to dislodge them. They're asking for a religious mediator. Well, that's out of question. That's why we're searching for grenades. Finally, we're in the heat of the battle. We've never been so close to the Taliban. How many of them are left? Some say five, others say 15. A simple but important question crosses my mind. How do we recognize a Taliban without his turban? There's only one simple answer. It's the guy who's firing at us. We're here, on this esplanade. Below is the southern courtyard where the Taliban's are. Under pressure from the Alliance, they have now retreated in the underground tunnels. Some Mujahideens went down to dislodge them. Uh -huh. 
It started back up again like yesterday. The war is on again, and the guys find nothing better to do than to look into my viewfinder. Below, it seems that the Mujahideens are still hesitating to charge into the underground tunnels. Holy shit. 11 a.m. The battle begins. Below, Alliance scouts have spotted the Taliban. They're trying to dislodge them from their hiding places. They have weapons. I have my camera. It's the only difference. There's the muffled sound of machine guns, the ground shaking. It's intense. I find myself liking this. It's a disturbing thought, but that's the way it is. I still can't see what they're shooting at or where the enemy is. The guys around me are acting as if they were in a Roman arena. Suddenly, on the right-hand side of the picture, a Tommy gun appears from the foot of the tree. I almost have to pinch myself to make sure that I'm not in a movie. In my viewfinder, I see another Taliban in the background. He's shooting relentlessly on the Alliance soldiers until he also gets himself caught in the line of fire. This is Akbar. To me, Akbar is a little like Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now, a leader who is a little crazy but charismatic and who exposes himself when everyone else takes cover and who puts a semblance of order in this chaos. When Akbar arrives, the atmosphere changes. He commands his men, and the battle then takes another turn. With all that happened, we barely had time to notice the field of dead bodies lying a few meters away from the battlefield. Yet they have been lying there for 48 hours. 
We just had to turn our heads. Is it over or not? It's hard to tell. With the Afghans, we never really know if there's danger or not. This time, it's Dodge that runs downhill first. More and more soldiers move towards the courtyard. Regaining some confidence, I joined Dodge. The fighters came down to finish their job and stopped in front of the dead Taliban bodies. However, in this situation, Akbar loses his authority. There's no room for a leader. The battle isn't even over yet, and the soldiers are already looting. Each man for himself. Apparently, during wartime, this is how it goes. Some take their knife to pull out golden teeth out of mouths. I don't film. Out of decency or insensitivity, for the first time I really feel the horror of war. Except for a few men, no one thinks of fighting anymore. When there's nothing left to loot, Akbar's men leave without finishing the job. <laughs> Unconscious of the danger, we continue to move forward. And we find ourselves in the middle of the battlefield, caught in a crossfire. I have only one thought in mind. That is to run as fast as possible to save my life. I jump over dead bodies without looking at them. I try to watch my step to avoid jumping on a mine. Once we're out, Dodge turns around. He didn't stop filming. Back on the Esplanade, I have the impression that it will never stop. And I'm not the only one. By this stage, you know, I've done three days of fairly hardcore uh, battle. And, uh, you know, my nerves were suffering. Um, every shot was just making me, making me flinch, you know, I was really tight. And I just wanted to get out of there. So, I talked with Dodge and Oleg and you, and, uh, and uh, we all decided we got enough. We could go home and come back tomorrow. It looks like the end is near. I don't have any batteries left. Dodge is filming. It's a shame. I would have liked to shoot this scene because it says a lot. One could draw the conclusion that Afghans are truly barbaric, when in fact it's the contrary. This man carefully covered this body before lying his gun on it. This is what I want to remember. It's closer to truth. Can we have a piece with Thank this? you. You are just. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think we deserve this. Yeah. 
outcome of the day. Lots of fright and quite a bit of luck. And above all, what fascinates me is the disregard that Afghans have for death. Why do they look more beautiful in war than in peacetime? Not everyone agrees. The legend of the great Afghan fighter, you know, died that day for me. I mean, uh, these guys were uh, no discipline, no training, uh, uh, scared most of the time, uh, smoking hash on the front line. Uh, I didn't see any great military strategy or skills or brilliant guerrilla tactics or anything like that. You know, these were just boys with guns, kind of scared. Um, who were probably fighting for a steady wage. I like the emotions that I felt today. I know it can be shocking to say this, especially given the horror that comes with every war, but why should I hide from it? I was taken by the situation. Surprisingly, like the Afghans, I find myself playing in front of the camera. I just returned from Kalai Jungi Fortress, which is about 10 kilometers outside of Mazar -e Sharif here. Back to Mazar, I continue to film, but this time for Dodge, the new special envoy of CBS, an American network station. Taliban prisoners were taken three days ago and were able. No, no. Shoot. That night, the colleagues we run into tell us that we've gone too far and we've taken too many risks. I relive the day in my head and I fall asleep with an odd dream that is punctuated by the sound of bullets. I wake up abruptly as if to prevent these pictures from being engraved in my mind forever. That night, my father calls me. He gives a brief and peremptory recommendation. Stop acting like a fool. Wednesday. Usually we arrive before the other journalists, but it is time for us to calm down. So today, we hang out in town, and we arrive after them. In the southern courtyard, there are dead bodies, lots of dead bodies. Men, of course, and horses. I don't want to spend more time on the men. It makes no sense. I find myself bawling out a colleague, because he nudges me to film death up close. Shall I ask him to smile for you, I say. They say that dead bodies are the moment of truth for journalists, not for me. I'm not saying this to seem a better man, but how can I say this? Here, dead bodies don't look like dead bodies. The only time I was shocked was when a tank ran over a body. The body sunk into the sandy ground. It left an imprint. A body in Afghanistan gathers dust very quickly. And uh, so even after a matter of hours, they have this sort of ghostly white covering. It kind of makes them feel almost unreal, you know. I've seen bodies in my life, but this, you know, it doesn't really affect you. They look so dead. They look so, there's no life in them at all that you can kind of walk past, you know. It's not spooky. It's just, uh, in some ways, you have to keep reminding yourself of how horrible it is. Two days ago, I was a nobody in this business. Today, I'm a cameraman for the BBC. My mother will love it. She's English. The whole truth about how this uprising began may never be known, but you can't help feeling that the Taliban soldiers whose bodies are now being taken away from here never wanted to be treated as prisoners of war. They intended to continue the war and to fight to the death. Angus Roxburgh, BBC News, in Kali Jangi Fort. What happened? Was anything happening behind? You've got the guy behind from the Red Cross. It's great. Yeah? Yeah. Let me do, can I do a, a, another one? It's a shame they're not... Thursday. Most of my colleagues are packing up. For them, the story of Mazar's prison is over. 
but not for Agnes or for me. First of all, I'm almost certain that there are some survivors left in the fortress. And I didn't come all this way to leave after six days. Anyway, I don't have an exit visa. So meanwhile, I'm shooting this report on a refugee's camp for the BBC. Friday. I can finally take a bath and run off to Mazar's hospital. Among the wounded, I find a municipal employee who was in charge of evacuating the dead bodies piled up in the fortress tunnels. I was moving dead bodies till about midnight. At that point, I thought there was only one left. I reached for him, and suddenly he turned over and shot me. The bullet went through my hand, blood splattered all over the place, and I ran away. We all climbed out except one that got caught by the Taliban. Saturday. The medical operations have resumed. I go back to the fortress. My first surprise, there are lots of survivors, 86 in total, and they are not in good shape. We flooded the basement, and so the Taliban's came out. One spoke Russian, Arabic, Hurdu, Pashtu, we asked them to tell the others, in their own language, that we were not murderers and that they shouldn't be afraid to come out. We're accused of killing them. Unfortunately, they brought it onto themselves. Among them, one man stands out. It's John Walker, the American. I'm filming John Walker without asking him any questions. You can see that he's carrying in him the horror that he lived through. They spent eight days and nights in hell, packed together like rats in the darkness of the underground. Colin from Newsweek interviews Walker. Question. Do you approve 9-11? Walker. I do. Question. Why did you come to Afghanistan? Walker. Because it's the world's purest Islamic republic. At first, Colin's questions shocked me. It made Walker look like a baby Ben Laden. But soon after, I regretted that decency. And now, like everybody, I want to interview him as well. How did he end up in Pakistan? Why did he join Al-Qaeda? Did he know beforehand for 9-11? So like Alex, Colin, the new guy, and everybody else, 
I follow Dostum's man on the road to Shebergan in the hopes of finding the American task force and therefore finding Walker. What we don't know yet is that we're not on equal ground. When we will arrive a little later at Shebergan Hospital, Walker will have disappeared. The American task force took him away. Walker will give his testimony to CNN only. In the afternoon, I return to the fortress alone. The guards aren't very ethical. They're ready to take advantage of the situation. They're pretending that a poor man's turban belongs to the leader of the Taliban, who's on the run. Mullah Omar, Dangotai. They're even ready to sell the diary of a prisoner. They're out of luck because I'm not interested. What I'm after here is to see what the Taliban's hideout looked like. Several days later, the place still bears the evidence of the violence. So what urges me to come back here when it's been over for such a long time? Nostalgia for strong sensations? The great chill that runs through your body when you run without cover? Or the joy of meeting again with Dodge, Alex and Oleg? Actually, for all of these reasons. But there's also this story which keeps haunting me. I went back to the site, but I'm still missing the key actors of the event. The Taliban's in prison in Shebergan. And I especially want to hear their version of the story, the way everything started. We were sitting in the inside courtyard when we heard this explosion coming from the basement. A gunfight had started. That was the beginning of the rebellion. That's when we decided to escape. Men from the Northern Alliance fired on all of those who moved. They were shooting us in the legs. In the yard, there were plenty of dead. We all thought we were going to die, but we were able to free each other. We hid behind trees. That's where I found a rocket launcher and started firing on the Northern Alliance. In the basements, conditions were very bad. There was nothing to drink, nothing to eat. By dawn, when it was still dark, some would try to get out and get some food. Many men that were with us didn't survive. Out of the 400 Taliban, there are 84 survivors. When I leave Shebergan, I have the impression that this story is well and done with. Most of the survivors were either returned to their native country or transferred to Guantanamo, Cuba. They're still Walker's case. Given this footage, any jury would have given him a maximum sentence. His lawyers didn't want to take the risk. Walker accepted to cooperate with the American judicial authorities to avoid a trial. He asked for forgiveness. He was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. <laughs> 